This is We Burlesque. Hey, it's Victor Devon. Thank you for listening. Special thank you to my Patreon supporters, Alex, Andrea, Bo, Joyce, Kelly Blue, Princess Chris, Rob Starabin, Ruthless Retribution, Stormageddon, and Drew Wilkinson. Really appreciate it. Don't forget, if you go to Patreon and you support any amount, you will have access to our monthly home theater editions, as well as, depending on your tier, uh, some other bonuses. So, thank you very, very much. Hi, this is TC Roosevelt. This is Bella Simmons. This is Femme Appeal. This is Serafina Walder. This is Rosie Cheeks, and you're listening to the We Burlesque Podcast, Season 5. Hey, this is Victor Devon, and our next live broadcast of We Burlesque Home Theater Edition is scheduled for April 28th and again on May 1st, 2021. There's a live gathering to watch at home burlesque routines featuring some fabulous entertainment with regulars Broody Valentino, Jack Barrow, and Queen Victoria. I'm also delighted to have Trinity Starlight return to our stage. And for the first time with White Elephant Burlesque, we have two Los Angeles phenomenons, Tita Bonino and Serafina Wilder. This is a virtual showcase that will feature a live interaction via Zoom on both nights, featuring chances to win prizes, some fabulous music, a cocktail hour, and these great performances. Please go to WeBurlesque.com to click to buy, or directly to WeBurlesque.WellAttended.com. I'll post the link in the show notes, and spend as little as $1 to gain access. Thank you so much. This is We Burlesque, the podcast. I am your host, Victor Devon, and I am delighted to be on the phone with uh, one of the great denizens of California burlesque. Uh, to speak to a burlesque performer in uh, the California region is to mention her. And uh, while most of this listenership, I understand because where I come from is East Coast, uh, I want to give them a, a, a real understanding of, of this entertainer. And I, I welcome everyone to experience Lily von Stupp. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I know some people on the East Coast. Um, I, I, got some, I got some fans. Oh, well, see, you that's know, the I... thing. Is it's I think because burlesque is so insular much of the time that we don't look beyond. And obviously the last year. No. Change the game, change the game, and we'll talk about that. But how awesome. I first first met you uh, online was you were dressed as B. Arthur as Maud. That's that was my <laughs> introduction to you. That was my introduction to you. That so, was that's awesome. That was yeah. literally one of my highlights in burlesque. I've, I've I've performed for celebrities. I've performed with celebrities, but that was an amazing night. That that was yeah yeah. Uh, so, I mean, was, was be a big icon for you? Cause she is for me. So I, I to... grew up watching all of the big shouldered broads that were funny because while Love me I... a big shoulder broad, love me a big shoulder broad. Yeah. I mean, I was sexy, but I was sexualized from such a young age that I never felt conventionally pretty. If that makes sense. I did beauty pageants, all of that kind of stuff to try to find that side of me, but I always went for laughter. I always went for diffusing the sexuality in a strange way. And so, you know, when I watched Maud, when I watched the golden girls, you know, B Arthur was that amazing Marine comic singer, dancer, and just genius comedic timing, in my opinion. So I was a huge fan. Absolutely. I mean, my, my fans go back to, you know, Joan Crawford and the, the power that she exudes that, you know, again, also transcend sexuality, in my opinion. But B just brought something that was so feminist and amazing in mod that I fell in love. Mm. And one day I'm sitting at my computer and I get an email and it says, hey, um, I work for Norman Lear and we're looking for a burlesque show. And I literally started crying and I'm, 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 I'm tearing up right now. And I was like, they are not going to ask to bring Norman Lear to my show or have me perform. They are not, you know, that's, that's crazy. Norman Lear bought a copy of the constitution and sent it on tour. Think about that. He also wrote the screenplay for the night they raided Minsky's. Mm-hmm. 
the, the complexity of what he has done, putting, uh, you know, interracial marriages and, and meathead on TV. I mean, incredible, another icon. And I'm like, this is amazing. So I wrote back and I said, yeah, we have a show on Monday night. Absolutely, we can treat him like any other person and not draw a huge deal to it. Um, I've never been a fan of TMZ or any of that kind of stuff. We have celebrities have birthday parties all the time. That's just not who we are. And they're like, great, we're going to show up at 830. My question is, is there anything special you can do? And I went, I am four days away from this. And I texted back, I can strip as Maud. And they wrote back and went, done. And I went, fantastic. And I sent him an invoice to come and have a private table at the, at the venue. And then I went, I have to go get a mod costume and a wig. And, and I literally called Brandy Snifter. She made a wig. I went through all of this. I'm there. I bring him in. I sit him down. My MC starts. The show starts. I go in the back. Brandy Snifter does my makeup. I put my costume on. And they hit the theme song to... And then there's Maud and I come walking out and do a lap dance for him essentially on stage. And he tries to put his hand down my pants, which is hilarious. And I'm like, Mr. Lear, you know? <laughs> and so I do the whole strip and I'm, I, it was so amazingly fun. And then I like gave him the little tease and I walk off. And after the show, he was the kindest. He stayed and talked with us. He talked about the night they raided Minsky's. He talked about Baggy Pants Comics. He talked about uh, Lucky Deluxe, who hosted. It was just one of those experiences where you're like, everything in my world just converged into one moment that was fantastic. And it was amazing. Oh, fantastic. I mean. I didn't mean to go into that story. but No, I, I, I love it, it. it. just. I love it. And, and to have him say, you are extremely funny. And then have one of his people come up to me afterwards and he said, you really captured B. He can't. And I just was like, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Because again, when you know, you you either in burlesque, you pay tribute or you mock, you know, and true. And the lines goal, can be blurry. Yeah. And my whole goal was to pay tribute because I am an older, big shouldered broad who's been through some shit. And it was just so amazing to channel that and have him enjoy it at the same time. And I have, I have like three incredible photos with him because we had a no photo policy. So I have no film of the act because he was on stage. But I have three photos with him that I just treasure. And then two weeks after I get a package in the mail and it is the complete series of Maud with a card that says, thanks for the dance, Norman. And it's on his letterhead from, from uh, Norman Lear Productions. And I'm like, there's a lot of amazing things I've had. That, that's framed. <laughs> that's yeah. framed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you're, you also, uh, your namesake is one of my very favorite uh, folks. Madeline Kahn, uh, yes. Madeline Kahn, who I, I grieve her loss every day. Can you imagine the things that we, we missed uh, from not having her in the, the late 90s through now? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. The, the one woman show that we would have had, the Broadway appearances that we would have had, ah, exquisite. Yeah, there there are so many things. That, well, there are so many great women that we lost far too early, and a mm -hmm. lot of them, unfortunately, to ovarian cancer, yeah. which just pisses me off to the max. Yeah, very um, shortly around that time, Anita Morris also passed. I think I believe of, of cervical or ovarian cancer as mm -hmm. well. Another one who I'm like, we missed there, so much opportunity. I'm so glad we got Elaine Stritch as long as we did. Oh, I know. I know. That's the one number I never did was I'm still here before Monday Night Tease ended. It made me sad. I wanted to do it, but by the end, I just don't have the energy to sing and dance anymore. It just doesn't, it doesn't happen. I get it. I do, I do her as uh, the, her opening, there's no business like show business with her whole yeah. monologue. I do yep. that because I, I'm a, I'm a fan. You're amazing. <laughs> I, got to see her, I got to see her live in New Haven. She was an extraordinary. Oh, I'm jealous. Yeah. And no, she was, uh, it was towards the end of the career and she was having a lot of memory issues. She was having a lot of um, being in the moment yeah. issues. And so she was leaning really hard on her piano player slash music director. And what she, at one point, cause I saw her do at Liberty, she stopped the show. She's like, this isn't in the show. If you know, <laughs> this isn't in the show, but you guys are pulling me through this. I and I was it. like, oh. I got to I got to see her do Sondheim. Uh, ah, love her. Oh. love her, love her, love her. But so tell me, um, if you had to give me the the Lily von Stupp greatest hits, 
just the track listing, what would be some of the, the main points that you really hope, not only just make the obituary, but that you hope while you are still here, folks say, yeah, damn, she did that. Gosh, it's, it's so hard because, and I'm not saying this to be like faux humble. I'm very proud of what I've accomplished, but I'm very aware of everything that I have accomplished. I accomplished because I had people who worked with me and believed in me. So solo accomplishments. Um, I did Viva Las Vegas in 2006, and I think there were 10 contestants and I came in 11. Um, it was, I was ill-prepared and it was very, very too soon for me to performing in a competition. Plus I'm not a fan of competitions. I'm not, I didn't even want one at the Hollywood Burlesque Festival, but people wanted one. And I said, okay, if that's, it's for the community, if that's what you want, that's what you want. Having gone from feeling so defeated performing at Viva. And again, I wasn't terrible. I just wasn't seasoned or prepared Mm. for my first thousand person room that it was in. And so I left that feeling like I have so much work to do as a performer and I have so much catch up to do because I left ballet and dance and all of that because I was like, your boobs are too big. You're never going to have a center of balance, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I just want to dance. Okay. I don't, you know, so I, I, I came from that to many years later, having known Audrey Deluxe and worked with her, she knew my work and she had me come co-host at Viva with Elvira and then brought me back the following year with. John Waters. Um, So if you want to talk personal accomplishments, I think the growth of being in uh, emceeing and having a show weekly, uh, being in radio and understanding the skill set of being an emcee brought me to the point where my friend, when I've recognized your work, I'm bringing in this big person and I need someone to support them. And I think you can do that. And that truly is what I think is one of my strongest gains because I did most of the work to be able to get there, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, that's probably one of my greatest accomplishments. The other thing I managed to do was hold a show together on Monday nights for enough years that everyone that wanted to take a shot at this had a chance to do that. And if you remember, I'm gonna cry. If you remember anything, Remember Monday Night Tees, because that put hundreds, probably 600 different performers on its stage over its run from the start of 2003 to uh, 2014. Is that what it was? No, it was uh, 2018, 2017. It's been gone three and a half years. What year is it? You do the math. I'm just like, right. Well, um, not than so, that, but how, how do we qualify a year anymore? Yeah, it was, it, it, it was just <laughs> under 15 years it ran. Um, and I managed to make that happen when in the beginning, you know, there were more people on stage than there were in the audience. And we were taking home seven dollars to doing the private parties with it, having Tarantino book it and being able to pay really well because we're doing private parties with the Monday Night Tees cast to putting on, you know, full productions of laughing with the wall. And again, it was my idea. And then me calling my friends and going, hey, let's do something really dumb. Because that's how I think all great things happen is somebody says, here's an idea that is so stupid. Why are we even attempting this? And then we do it. Yeah. And so if, if my greatest hit is I helped to put people on stage so that they could facilitate art for many years, I think that would be my greatest accomplishment. Um, because Same. that's that's amazing to me. Yeah. It's, you know, and again, I love performing. I love dancing. I love stripping. I love singing. I love doing all of these things. But man, when you can cheer your friends on, I think that's just as important. So well, that's, that's how my... I've been. That's how I've been able to maintain a little sense of understanding of burlesque in the digital realm. Is even because uh, White Elephant has switched to virtual and it's yeah. all video. And we did a video show together for uh, Peep Show Menagerie. Yeah. Um, and the fun of it to me is not just watching the video because I can do that by myself, but I'm not going to do that by myself. I'm going to do that with a chat room full of people who are all talking about it at the same exact time. That's what I enjoy out of it because I can't even do that in person. I can't talk with, well, I can do that with, if I'm far enough away with that one person that I can chat with, but I love a banter. I love a banter. And, and this gives me that opportunity to watch it with folk, which I miss and then snap and cheer using my words and try to be funny. <laughs> I, 
I have a lot of friends that are hurting really hard right now because part of their process is the energy and the applause that they get back. And you don't have that. When you watch your performance with people watching you and you see them write yay, or you see their hands shaking like, you know, um, applause, you, you, you feel it, but you don't feel it the way you do on stage. There was a moment at the, at the, can you hear that? They're mowing in my backyard. I don't know. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> it makes me laugh. You don't have to edit it out. I'm just like, oh, there's the lawn people are here. <laughs> um, there was a moment on stage though at, with John Waters because that was the the arena. And it was the first time I was in a theater. I think it holds 9,000, I think is what it was. And when you walk out into a venue that holds 9,000 people, there is an energy in that room that you can't get anywhere else. And so I really feel the pain that a lot of performers are having not being able to perform. And I love the fact that we are going to wait this out and we are going to be able to get back on stages. And hopefully some of the venues will still be there. I know in LA, we've lost three venues already that are never coming back. Um, And that is heartbreaking. Um, but business is business. And, and, you know, we, I remember when I was knocking on doors in 2004 going, hello, can I do a burlesque show here? And they're like, what's burlesque? At least they know what it is now, people. We're going to get menus back. I promise. But, but I watch that heartbreak. And then I see the flip side of the performers who are, wow, I can create something all by myself in one encapsulated piece and present that in a different format. And I am so happy for them because It's different, but it's still an amazing art form online as well, especially if it's done well. I shot the original burlesque uh, podcast as video. My idea was shoot the dancers, license the music, pay it, and then sell it for a dollar on iTunes. And then iTunes changed their entire format that year, and they brought everything in for a dollar. And I went, no one is ever going to find these videos that I made. So I have eight videos of Audrey Deluxe and Stephanie Blake and myself and um, uh, got Eliza Bain, who doesn't even perform anymore, that are all licensed and ready to go. And when this whole thing happened, I went, hey, I have a video from 2008 that I shot. Can you use that? And two people went, yeah. And so I got that video used now. But it was the concept of create a create a little movie make your own music video and, and license that out as your work and do it once and license it many, which again, I love making money off of burlesque. So if I can videotape something once and get paid to put it in four different shows, I'm all for it. I don't have to work again. (laughs) So It's different, but it's just as valid in my opinion. Right. Well, you mentioned that your transition to coming back in the live game is going to be a little rougher than for many of us. Uh, a, and A lot of people don't know this, but I'm semi-retired, or at least I thought I was semi-retired. And then everything went online and I went, oh, hey, I have a whole different marketing plan that I don't have to do all by myself because everybody's marketing burlesque online right now. Okay, this could work. But I have some health issues. I have... Um, I have osteoarthritis, which is probably the worst right now because I've had two knee surgeries and my left knee probably needs to be replaced, but I have EDS, which is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a connective tissue disease, which is why the two surgeries that I've had on it didn't work. And they want to either do a replacement or blah, 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 but I may never walk again if it doesn't heal properly. Um, so I'm in a situation where I'm like, fuck, then my right eye blew out and I was like, I can't see anything to the right. And when I'm on stage with the spotlight, I can't see. So I have to wear an eye patch on stage, which is hilarious. Um, but, but all of these things came to the point of where I was like, it is a struggle for me to be on stage to perform or to MC. And so I decided to kind of take a step back and figure out what it was that I wanted to do with my life. And the other problem is I am extremely allergic to smoke and any type of chemical. So when I walk into a venue and three performers walk in with perfume on, it immediately triggers an ocular migraine. (laughs) So I can't MC or perform because my head is throbbing and I can't stand up because I'm dizzy and the light just kills me. So being in venues is really hard. So as I watch everyone transition now back to going to venues, I'm extremely happy for them and I applaud them and I am so happy for them. But I'm also happy that I have found something now that I can do online mm-hmm. that I think will still be viable for me as an art. 
So I may not be able to step into a venue because the chemicals make me sick or there's smoking outside the back door or there's perfume or there's bright lights or all of that, but I can create my own little burlesque world and present it the way I want to, which is kind of what I'm doing right now with dinner and a showgirl. Um, Walk us through that. Yeah, that that's a show that created because I was on TikTok trying to pretend like I was still someone. If you if you look at my my uh, any of my about me's, it says Google. Me, I, I used, used to be, be someone. 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 <laughs> yeah. Again, that's tongue in cheek. I'm very proud. I've been in the top fifty, you know, twice. I have I have accolades. I don't I don't sit here and crave for those things, but I do crave the art terribly sometimes. So being able to develop this fake cooking show, because I also can't cook, and then toss it off to my friends who are doing these incredible acts and burlesque and comedy and all of that is a great way to still be able to do a show by producing a little online event. And and it got good reviews and people are enjoying it. And the next one's coming April, what is it, April 24th? Um, I got a great cast for it. And, you know, I'm real excited about that. So everybody else gets to like, everybody else gets to go back to the world. And I'm like stuck at home for the summer is how I feel. (laughs) But they keep coming over and playing with me on spring break. So it's, it's been kind of cool. It it really truly has. And now with vaccines, we're going to be able to have people in our backyards again, and I'll be able to do shoots with other people and not have to do all of the video and editing myself. <laughs> right. Well, was that something that you had already a background in or Well, I did radio and I produced a show called The Net Music Countdown with our company Online Today Inc. It was the first show that ever ranked music that was sold or streamed online and it was uh-huh. syndicated by Dick Clark. And I only say this cuz I'm really proud of this. We yeah. we did some great work there too. Um and so I would do some of the audio editing. I learned how to audio edit and Audio editing is similar to video in a lot of ways. Um, When you're visually watching your peaks to pull your cues together and things like that. So when you're watching video and learning how to edit, transitions are done the same way. So I kind of walked into it pretty easily. With Monday Night Tees, I used to get the DVDs, rip them, and I would like edit off the front, the back, and I'd throw a title on and I was like, we're good. Now I'm doing two cameras, you know, extra footage shot outside, and I'm bringing things in and picture on picture. And you know, it's certainly not movie quality, but it's certainly a $20 ticket on a Friday night to see some entertainment quality. Um, so it's been interesting to learn that and, and hone that, that process. And again, I will also say I am privileged that I have a computer that can run, you know, a, a video editing. I have a professional microphone because I did radio. I have things that put me two steps ahead of a lot of performers. So don't beat yourself up if you didn't jump into this. And I, I admit those privileges. Um, and at the same time, if you're still trying to work on it, call me, I'm happy to help you any way I can. Um, you know, that's, that's part of this is, you know, we all lift each other up and all the boats rise. So, but yeah, so I did, I did. And boy, I talk a lot. Sorry. No, it's please. <laughs> sort of the point. No one wants to listen to the dead air. Uh, it's less for me to, less for me to pull. Um, so in terms of uh, moving into the virtual realm with Jenner and Showgirl and your Tuck Tuck videos and, and all of that, is the satisfaction for you? Are you one of those people who does miss that, that applause or can you uh, sort here's of look how, within your head and, and get through it? Here's, um, here's how I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna explain that. I loved the excitement of the audience and the power of having a microphone and commanding the room. Or if I'm doing a strip tease, the power of, you know, waiting for that person to take their next breath for me to give them permission to do it because they're in shock of what I've done on stage. And they're just Mm -hmm. gasping for air and waiting for me to tell them it's okay to love me or hate me, depending on the act. I I do love that. But I was never, I was never the crowd favorite. At the end of the show, hundreds of people would walk up to, and and again, this this is not derogatory or mean in any way. It's the reality of it. When when you are Coca-Cola and everyone knows and likes Coca-Cola, they go to Coca-Cola. But there are also people who really like Orange Fanta. And they'll be like, I'm going to go see the Orange Fanta. I was always the Orange Fanta. Um, And I was okay with that. I would love it when young guys would come up to me after the show and they would say things like, I've never been attracted to an older woman before. 
And, you know, rather than getting pissed off, I'd go, mm hmm, I get it. Thank you. <laughs> you know, glad your eyes glad are to up. break you in. <laughs> Or they'd come up and they'd say, I watch way too much porn because women are amazing taking their clothes off. And I'm like, yep, you need to learn foreplay, young man. Or women would come up to me and they would say, I want you to know that you have breasts like I have breasts. And I've always been ashamed that my breasts are long because I've breastfed or I've done this or I've done that. And seeing you on stage makes me know that I'm still a valid, sexy woman. Thank you. Mm-hmm. That was always my fan base. My fan base was never everybody going, oh my God, you're so beautiful and you're so talented and you're so wonderful. And it's not that anyone didn't think I was those things. It was, there was always, as the showgirls thing goes, someone younger, prettier and, and, you know, and, and that's okay because, uh, you know, when you cast a show, you cast a show so that everybody in the audience can fall in love with whatever it is that they love. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the beauty of diversity. Um, so I was okay with that. And the thing that I found out with dinner and a showgirl is those people are still out there. And the emails that I got after the show were, that was hilarious. That was funny. Or they would be like, you are so comedic and wonderful. And you, you make me want to just live my life more. And that to me is what matters. And so doing that as a disabled 55 year old, you know, with long floppy tits as the review I have on Yelp is, um, it's wonderful to see that those people still are there and can find you. And to me, that was always the joy of the internet anyway, was finding out those freaks that feel like you and and finding them. I mean, the most successful- There's 20 in a chat room. Yeah, well, the most successful uh, YouTubers are, are uh, the Mamrie Hearts, the Jenna Marbles, the, yep. the folks who are the, the funny best friend role. And yeah. it's, and they're not, they're not unsexy, but the, nope. where they, where their sexiness comes from is humor. And again, we're going to fall back into the B. Arthur, Madeline Kahn, yeah. Chorus Leachman's, all of these, these funny broads that we, that very rarely got the lead. Yes. But obviously folks yep. like, uh, until yep. like, until they got to a certain age, which is interesting. Then they became the scene stealers, didn't they? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, if you look at Betty White right now, you can't watch a film without going Betty White, isn't it? There's a beautiful documentary on her, either on HBO or Netflix. I can't remember any of them. It's on Netflix, movies. yeah. They're all just one show now. Um, <laughs> it's like, my iPad plays movies. I will go watch one. <laughs> I have no idea what any of them are. And, and it's not because I'm like, oh, technology. It's just, I have four, I think, that are streaming and I never know which one I'm watching because they don't have commercials constantly reminding me at CBS. Um <laughs> Weird branding on online, by the way. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that you can get something out of it depending on what it is that you want. Um, I would love to go back and do a live show sometime and maybe there will be a time when I can do that and I want to do that. Maybe it will be the next Hollywood Burlesque Festival where I finally go, all right, I'm just going to perform once and that's it. And then I'm going to sit in the corner the rest of the night and make up for the pain. Um, but I don't know. You know, I know I can't travel anymore. I can't be on a plane. I can't sit. When I get off, my knees are so bad. I can't walk my lower back, my neck. I have four vertebrae that are supposed to be fused together, but they don't want to do it. They want to wait for a better surgery. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's it's constant pain, um, which sucks. But at the same time, I'm like, I still have to live. We still have to live. Right. (laughs) So I found something to do and I'm really happy about that. Good. I mean, I, I, I'm delighted to know that. And one of the, the times that we've gotten to work together was through the Hollywood Burlesque Festival, which, yes, I know, audience at home, I walked away with a sash and a crown. That's not what I'm getting to. Well, uh, get to it right now, because here, here's what I tell everyone when they win something. Um, do you know what you win? The ability to have a marketing tool. Fucking use it. Use yeah. it appropriately don't use it over your friends use it on a flyer use it to get booked you know you you were the best that night and that's fantastic and and take that and own it and use it as much as you possibly can oh it's it's being used it's being done but (laughs) in in my in my in my weak moments in my weak moments every now and then uh that was, the, that was the thing, and I, I have mentioned it, but I haven't said it to you uh, specifically, is that when I walked into that room, I was a recent Southern Californian transplant. Mm-hmm. I had my husband with me. I knew maybe six or seven other performers that night 
because it is uh, national. And those, the ones I knew were East Coasters, but I was the only one who was now being identified as a Californian. And none of that was promised to me. None of people being kind to me or nice to me. And not that I've walked into a lot of snake pits, but we know that even if it's not a snake pit, it can still be a little icy or a little unfamiliar. No one has to like you. Uh, and no one even has to say hi if we're all stuck in our own heads, particularly in a competition mode. Yep. Because what's everyone worried about? Everyone's worried about not fucking up, uh, being uh, acknowledged and being recognized. And I gotta say, in my in my nearly 15 years and more than that, because I, I count Rocky Horror for a lot of my stage work as well, um, it's never been the audience that I've had a problem with or has had a problem with me or that I've ever had any real tension with. But other performers, I have admittedly, and I've way let this go, because fuck it, life is too short. But early, early on, it was like, I'm not as shiny as them. I'm not the showgirl. I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. And, but that wasn't what I was doing and I wasn't coming for them. And early on, I mean, you get enough male hosts that make jokes all through act one about, isn't it funny if a guy did it? And then, hey, I'm in act two. Um, or you work with some of these fabulous, I mean, I, we work in beauty, like the, the most yeah. beautiful, beautiful people. Um, but to walk in and, and sort of be the new guy for Hollywood of all things. And my first time to Hollywood, first time ever in Hollywood. And walking off that stage about an hour before the crowns even came out, I was off that stage and the, all of the cast members applauded and kept applauding as I walked to the dressing area. That was never promised to me. And I felt immediately accepted, wanted and desired. And that was the best thing in the world. Anything else, I mean, I'll keep the sash, but anything else was <laughs> was gravy that night. Um, and that was the best thing. And that was, I mean, that was one of the great things is that the facilitation of you as a producer, of you as a festival coordinator, and I know you have a lot of help and you have a lot of work, but someone has to wrangle. Yes. Um, that is the greatest gift is to have someone who facilitates and gets all those people and them still not be assholes. That's the best thing in the world. So. I I have a pretty strong no asshole policy because if people are assholes, I confront them and I say, hey, here's the thing. Um, we're not making millions of dollars here and everyone here doesn't work for you. Um, you're going to have more fun and get further in this industry if you realize that everyone is not competition in the way you think they're competition. And even in a competition, and I don't know if you were in the room, but I walked into every dressing room before the competition. And I say this every year. I say, I want you all to know how proud I am of you. Mm -hmm. Go out there, leave it on the stage mm -hmm. and know that that's the best you can do. Do it for the audience. And that's, that's it. That's our job. And if you get recognized tonight, great. If you don't, you still made the finals and you're here tonight. Mm -hmm. And these people deserve your best. So go do it. And that's, that's really how I feel about it, even though I myself don't like competitions. Sure. Um, but that's because of my personality, my own insecurities, the fear of my dyslexia, the fear of my, uh, you know, which growing up, I didn't know that I had EDS. I just thought I wasn't as good as anybody else because my body wasn't good and I didn't try enough. And I, you know, worked really hard and would get hurt consistently and not understand that. So all of that is in my head when it comes to competitions. Mm -hmm. um, if I were physically more able, I think I could pull that out of my head. Even now, it's a hard time for me to go, I'm disabled. That word still is hard for me at times. But, but if we are all pulling and rowing in the same direction, the audience is going to love the best of us and the one who has the costume failure. And we're all going to have a good time together and it's going to be okay. And we're going to hug each other afterwards. And that's something I always tried to do at Monday night teas. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people didn't like that. They didn't like me. They didn't want to work with whatever. And that's okay too. find, find your place in this. But I just find if we put the ego at the door and we put the effort in the show, we just succeed so much more as performers and I'm really happy to hear that because it means that the work I did pulling the people together to do that show paid off. Mm -hmm.
Absolutely. it means that all of the people that bought tickets that were fans of Monday Night Tees over the years knew and trusted me that I would present a good show and they came and they had a good time. I mean, one year Reagan was there and he jumped over the counter at the bar and started helping slinging drinks because the staff there was so far behind because the Mayflower is essentially a, a um, private British club. They hold high teas mm. and bingo. It felt, very, it felt very Elks Lodge. It's very me. weird. It used yeah. to be a church at one point. Okay, I but believe I, that. I chose the venue because LA is 99 seats, 50 seats, 1,000 seats. And this was a 250 seat theater that I knew I could spend $10,000, break even, do an event for three to four days, and everybody would have a good time. There'd be snacks in the kitchen. Hopefully we could feed you at least one meal while you're here a day. Mm -hmm. The ramen um, was excellent. Yeah. So Shin, Shin, <laughs> Shin on Hollywood and La Brea. They sponsor dinner and showgirl for me. You can order food to go and you can sit and eat while I cook. It's hilarious. Mm -hmm. But, but the idea of that was it is a community festival. It is for us to get together and celebrate and be great. And if you don't make the stage this year, maybe you'll make the stage next year. It isn't a click. It isn't a, it isn't a, it's, you know, there are, there are people from all around the country that go, these are the coolest acts. And some got in because they were amazing. And some got in because they were just so goddamn weird. They were wonderful. And we, we tried to make sure that we had all of those things. And we tried to make sure that people felt welcome. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm so happy that you feel that way. Oh, it was great. It was one of the great, it was one of the greatest shows. Um, I, I just, bar none. And, and also to watch, cause I, I got to see folks that, I would not have had an opportunity to see previously. I mean, I do miss the festivals. Uh, a festival experience, a well-curated, well-produced festival is gold because the backstage, the hanging out, yeah. the, 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 act, the, the moment when the, the customers don't come, <laughs> uh, yes. show business. I mean, listen, it's, 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 it's a greatest hits list. It's a greatest hits list. Yeah. And to be included as a greatest hits and as someone who, again, felt a little behind. I still feel like I'm a little behind. Uh, I, I turned 30, I turned 30. Behind. Well, I get it. And I, I've yeah. had to, I have to have had to acknowledge that that's not going to change um, necessarily, but I have to give myself allowances and say, you know what though, but look at, look at, look at what I'm doing and just keep doing it. And it will work out because I, I've been fortunate enough to surround myself with people that I, I trust, love and work with. And clearly you and I have that in common. Yes, yes. So. And, and I will say this, and I feel bad about this. There are some people that don't have that mindset yet. Mm -hmm. You know, Satan's Angel always says it's it's about the journey, not the destination in the striptease. I feel that way about your career as well. Every show you do should allow you to grow both as a performer and a human being, I hope. Um, being surrounded by people who give you support should allow you to not necessarily become more vulnerable, but to allow you to challenge yourself. I always say, don't push your boundaries, widen them. You know, don't do things you're uncomfortable with, get comfortable doing new things. It, it's, it's the way you look at life. Don't ask for validation from people who are non-experts. Don't walk around looking at other people and going, their life is X, Y is my life not X, my life is Y. If I spent my entire life trying to be, you know, Roxy Delight or Michelle Lamore or, um, you know, uh, oh God, there's so many that I admire, but I always go back to the ones that made such an impact to me. Julie Atlas Muse. I yeah. wish I could be Julie Atlas Muse. Unfortunately, um, you know, I'm 55 and I can't bend over without getting dizzy anymore. I'm not getting into a giant balloon. It isn't going to happen. You know, I can't hold my fans anymore because of my hands. So I, I've sold them all off to people I love and I know they're going to continue on with those. And when you have that connection to the art and the community, it changes the way you are. So if you feel left out in a community, sometimes you have to look into yourself and ask, is this community not for me? Because it doesn't have the same goals and values in, as me. Um, it's not like Monday Night Tees was a click and I only hired Monday Night Tees people. What would happen a lot of times was I would be having like eight people in the show and then someone would cancel and I would go, who's available on a Tuesday night? I know Carmel's not working. Carmel, I need somebody right now. So she was booked more than other people because she was available and on a moment's notice, I knew she could show up. 
Mm-hmm. It wasn't because she was my best friend. Mm-hmm. I, I had called three other people before I got to her sometimes, but people think that, oh, it's a click and you only ever do that. I love it when performers walk up to me and go, hi, you're Lily Von Stubb. I'm so-and-so and I'm new in this. And what's the best way for me to contact you to get booked? And I would say, email me a video. Or I would say, if you don't have a video on Monday at six o'clock, you can come in and you can do a thing and let me see what you can do and I'll book you. I would constantly do that. But I can't mind read and Mm -hmm. go, that performer's never been booked in my show. If they've never contacted me or come to me or tried to come, I can't do it. I put a post up recently. If you've got a problem performer, call them up and say, I don't want to get in your business, but do you suffer anxiety? Is that why you're constantly late sending me music? Is it because you're afraid to do things? Because I'll call you up and, and talk with you while you send me your music and remind you how happy I am to have you in the show and and make all of the the necessary accommodations to make you feel comfortable here. But if we don't do that and performers don't want to or can't make that effort, they're always going to feel like the outsider. And that's part of what I think we owe to burlesque performers is to give them that feeling of warmth and connection and allow them that we're all somehow broken or flawed or have something in us that doesn't work the way everyone else does from normality, whether it's a disability, a mental illness, a stress or, you know, a no car. You know, I've had performers that don't have a car and I sent another performer to pick them up and paid gas money because everybody should be able to do this if they want to ask for the help that you need. And I know it's hard, but don't think everybody hates you because they probably don't even know you. <laughs> right. And that's and that that's fixable. That yes. if that's the least of it, yes. then that's fixable. Yes. It's, it's so hard to read minds and be angry or upset about not getting booked in a show. Do you know how many shows I'm not booked in or ever called for? When you wrote me, did you see my response? Oh my gosh, yes, thank <laughs> you. I would love to be a part of this. I, I didn't reach out because I don't need to. I'm not promoting anything. I'm not, you know, my ego is not that big. And I'm like, you've got a great thing going and you're interviewing people and you choose the people that you choose for the reasons that you choose. I was honored to be invited okay. to be on this podcast. And invariably, never it. you know <laughs> well, what that's I mean? the other thing is that invariably I, I have had some people who have said, Hey, I've never done your podcast. You're like, and I'm like, you're right. You want to, cause I can't right? necessarily keep up with everybody else either. I mean, I have a billion things going on and well, not the least of which is my own anxiety and, and issues. So uh, I think everyone's going through their own struggle. Yeah. And if anything, this pandemic has uh, exposed a lot of that and it oh, gosh, has yeah. made that normalized to a degree and i hope i hope that those who have taken the initiative to be kinder because of it hold on to it and those who have taken the initiative to be worse about it get buried and never and never uh experience happiness (laughs) i wish happiness on my enemies i just wish them to be happy elsewhere that's, that's, valid. that's my that's philosophy. Valid. I, you know, there are a couple of people in this industry. I have a real hard time working with. I mm-hmm. will if I have to, but I don't want to. Mm-hmm. I've, I've had personal experiences that are really hard, but personal is personal. Business is business. I can show up at a venue and work with anybody, whether I like them or not, whether I think they're a good performer or not. My job as a performer is to show up and be part of the team that creates a great production. Mm-hmm. It's not just about me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and maybe part of that is because I was never the lead. I was always the best friend or the Columbia or the, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and that's okay too, because yeah. without those people, there is no full production. Um, you need that. I've been backstage. I've been in front of stage. I've been on camera. I've been behind the camera, you know, and, and when you have all of those things, you do jump behind the bar and start making drinks or Stephanie Blake helped mop the venue. Two-time Miss Exotic World title holder. No, I'm sorry. I mean, not Stephanie Blake. Um, uh, oh, God. Uh, Lovey Goldmind was the one that, that helped mop me. Stephanie Blake oh, is the one that me. always comes and does everything for me because oh, she's- I met, Lovey, I met Lovey right before the pandemic. And what a sweetheart. Yeah, what a nice sweetheart. You know, and so, you know, there's in Joe's book, I think it was Dirty Martini that would sweep up at the show. Or maybe it was World Famous Bob. I can't remember because um, everyone in New York is one person right now in my head. Sure. Yeah, I, I can't get all their names together. It's, it's, it's like that. It's like that part scene in Return to Oz where it's one body and they just change the heads. Yeah, there you go. 
So, um, plus names are really hard for me because of my dyslexia. And so, because I don't see a lot of people and talk a lot, my also, brain- A lot of our names are very similar. Down. Sometimes our names are very similar, so. So, um, so anyway, you know, the, the thing is when, when you're, when you're putting into it more than you're taking out from it, it's a different experience. I've been paid, you know, two drink tickets to perform my poodles act. I've been paid a thousand dollars to perform my poodle act. Same friggin' act. Mm -hmm. Two different venues, two different prices. If I went around all of my life going, I won't do this again unless you pay me a thousand dollars and you bring me green M&Ms, I would never work again except maybe once where there was that place where the whole world converged and they really wanted my poodle act. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just, you have to realize that we're all bit players in a way, no matter how much success we have. Yeah. I don't know. Although I will say, yeah, TikTok has come along and I am extremely popular in foreign countries. I have only 7% following in the United States and they love my boobs. So I have found a fan base that is different on TikTok than is in any of my other outlets. So, you know, you could also find your audience somewhere else. You are listening to Weber Less, the podcast, season five. If you would like to join the Weber Less podcast network, please email weberlesk at gmail.com, subject line podcast, and let me know what you have in mind. Our guest today is the buxom glamazon known as Lily Von Stupp from Los Angeles. You can go to the show notes of this episode to see all the links for them, including dinnerandashowgirl.com and patreon.com forward slash Lily to support all of their artistic endeavors online. You can also visit Lily Von Stuck and Hollywood BQ Fest on Instagram and Twitter. That's L I L I B O N S C H T U P P. And Hollywood BQ Fest is H O L L Y W O O D B Q F E S T. As ever, we were less thanks you for your support. Whether you listen, subscribe, follow, review, or donate at patreon.com forward slash we were we appreciate all that you do to keep our voices heard. Please be safe. But going back to the original thing, if you're uncomfortable in burlesque, ask yourself why. Ask mm. yourself why you don't fit into the local community. Because I can tell you, there's there's a wonderful performer in LA, Mia Morte, who rips her face off. And I'm like, that's a great act. I can't put it between a balloon act and a fan dance. Um, it doesn't work in the flow of the show I produce. So let me figure out how to put it in a show. And we created a show so that I could book her. Mm -hmm. the, the point is, talk to the people you want to work with and be real. You know, we're all real. We're all just trying to make a show happen, make a few bucks and, and create some art. At least most of us are, yeah. um, you know. The ones who last, frankly. Well, I, I think so. There's a lot of venues that have come into L.A. and gone that were, you know, high end, what I call serial rocket shows. Okay. where it's the same body style, the same type of dance, and it's just one after another. And it's beautiful and it's gorgeous. And I am not degrading that in any way by saying it. It's a specific set style. Then there's what the fuck less, which you've done, which is, you know, literally, I'm sorry, you would like to pretend to poop on stage and smear it all over your body. We're in. How does Thursday look? <laughs> and, you know, it's like, some people walk into that and they're like, what in the fuck? And that's why it's named that way. And honestly, the first time I saw, I, the first time I heard about the show, I went, oh, I'm going to hate this, I think. And I went to the venue and I was just like, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> this is, I, yeah. And you know what? It works perfectly because, because Brandy and um, I am thinking of her real name, not her face, Tiffy, Tiffy Twister, Tiffy, Tiffy. Are, are both so in sync with what they're looking for that that show is absolutely spectacular. Um, but again, if you don't want to see people smear food on themselves, you're going to hate the show. You know, they have a whole show called Tarpapalooza. And if you're creeped mm -hmm. out by that, you're not going to like it. Um, but that's if you, have an, if you have an issue with clown, don't go to the clown show. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. It's but like, if you have don't have an issue with clowns, but you don't want the sploosh aspect, then only go to the clown show. Yeah. That's the fun thing, too, is how it's variety, terrible. even the messy can be. You know, and Monday Night Tees tried to go mainstream for the most part. There were weird acts in there. And, you know, in hindsight, I wish I would have 
I wish I would have pushed harder, but I was so focused on making sure that every month it broke even mm. so that I could keep doing it, that sometimes I would go, I think that's a bit far and it would really freak out some of my regulars. Because I mean, I had people who would buy tickets for three shows out of four every month. That's that's strong. And when you yeah. start pissing off 20 people that that spend $60 a month with you, that's a huge impact on a show. And I think sometimes I allowed that to let me make less artistic choices, if that makes sense. Um, but then we also would sometimes, you know, I did Meat Fest and I would literally advertise it. And I would tell my, my guys that would come because they really like hot women. I would literally write them an email and I'd be like, hey, don't forget next week is Meat Fest. And I know you're not going to enjoy the show. And they would be like, cool, I'm going to go do X, Y, and Z. Thanks for the heads up. Because I had that opportunity because it was only a, you know, 100, 100 person venue max. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I sometimes I think let that not let me do some of the things I wanted to do. But I also did some really dumb stuff there. So I'm really proud of it. <laughs> well, it's that intersection between art and entertainment. You have yeah. to make decisions based on what is your core yeah. and your energy. Yeah. And, and th damn it, this is my statement. And also, yeah. oh, right. People got to watch it. Right. It's not a picture on the wall that people can pass by and experience. Yeah, you also got to be involved. You know, I mean, I did the show. Um, I did the, the Lilac show. I speak for the vaginas and it mm. was all like body issues. And, uh, you know, you know, we had we had an act about rape and it was really confronting to people. And, you know, it was one of those where I kind of had to put a, a warning on it before I really understood what trigger warnings were for. Again, I'm 55. I've learned a lot in the mm. last 10 years. I've unpacked some white privilege here, okay? I'm doing the work, I promise you. And I can also promise you I am not perfect, but I keep trying. Um, but I mean, there were so many things in that show that I had to also kind of go, this is going to be so different. And I really hope I market it correctly so that people who don't want to be here aren't here. Mm -hmm. And, and that's part of that too, is, you know, you don't want to go start a show called the sexy, sexy review. And then it comes out and it is literally nothing but clown porn burlesque. People will be like, what the hell? Marketing is so important in this and knowing who you are as an, as an artist or a show. And we evolved over the the 15 years and changed a lot the only thing that remained was the format of eight performers one of them was a variety artist that's the only thing that that was consistent in in the the years i produced the show right goodness gracious though so, so what you accomplished what you've done yeah what what and what you've had done alongside you like and these that's the one thing also is that digital performances do uh, do give the ability if not always uh the ability to archive and save yeah. and be seen again so many things that we as entertainers and artists experience it just had to be there for yeah. and well, and you have that to kind of impermanence is so video. frustrating. <laughs> but you have to create it different for video. True. And True. that's something that a lot of people took a hard or a longer time understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, I shot a video and and literally went back and watched some of my favorite music videos. I started looking more at art direction of films and why I liked those films. And then I went, I'm going to do the whole thing in my wheelchair. The camera is going to be static angled down because it's going to make my boobs look good. And then when I walk into the camera, my boobs are going to focus up into it when I step out of the chair. And so it was like really this thought process and it ended up being one take. I did another one and it was literally six days filmed and edited mm -hmm. together. And it's, it's that idea of you can't, you can't do a stage performance on video unless you've got five cameramen and some really good editors and make it translate the same way. When we, when we would do this stuff for, for Hollywood Burlesque Festival and they would submit videos, mm -hmm. one of the things that I wrote to the judges was, remember, you're not sitting in the audience right now. Put yourself in the audience and watch this because this is live. You're not mm -hmm. just judging the video. And that, that is something that I think really translates differently. But you also connect differently because you're looking right into the lens, directly into the eyes of, of your audience if you want to. Mm -hmm. Or in spite of them. Like there's so many choices, so many choices one can make. I love peep uh, acts yeah. where you just totally ignore the camera. Yeah, oh, beautiful. yeah it's fun.
So um, let's talk a little bit about what the, the next phase of the Hollywood Burlesque Festival, which you produce, uh, what that's gonna look like for 2021. So I made the decision that I am not doing a festival. And then I made the decision that that is not fair. <laughs> Literally pulled people in the LA Burlesque and I said, hey, do you wanna do a festival? And everybody was like, I really wanna wait till we come back. I really wanna wait till we come back. And I said, that's amazing. So I decided to do a Hollywood and Southern California film festival. And all of April, people could submit their videos and um, their videos would be judged in categories as long as we got at least three that qualified in that category. Um, we will give away all of these different titles, but we went full movies because we're Hollywood. We're going to do best art direction, set direction, best director, best lighting, best costume, you know, best performance, best foreign film. Um, it's going to be tongue in cheek, kind of. Um, but I think that the top 50 had a best of this year and, mm -hmm. and it was very controversial. If you followed it, people were like, you know, a lot of us can't perform, so we don't qualify and a lot. And I was like, but at the same time, people have moved to a new industry. Let's validate that because for a year, people stepped out of their comfort zones and tried something new. You know, when I would talk with Dixie at exotic world, which I had the privilege of attending in 2005 out at the farm. Um, we talked one time about how burlesque changed, how it was the heyday of strip teasers, but it was also the, the talkie girls. And then it went into, uh, you know, smaller clubs and then there were circuits and then it died down and then television killed it. And then air conditioning brought it back a little bit because air conditioning was in theaters and then it evolved and changed and then it went away and then it was strip clubs. And then it was, and I'm like, we've had a year where it evolved and changed mm -hmm. and we, that's our history now. So let's do little movies and we're going to have an international film festival. And at the end of May, which is our traditional, you'll be able to buy a ticket for the award show. There'll be some guest performances. There'll be some clips from the, the videos that were voted on because you're going to get to vote on them for best audience, you know, and uh, you'll be able to buy a ticket. All of the money that brought in is going to go to the winners. So, you know, not going to make any money this year again on a festival. But I also, that isn't my goal with it. My goal is to say, hey, these people did something. Let's acknowledge it. So HollywoodBurlesqueFestival.com, you can find us there. And Victor, I hope, we haven't finalized this yet. I hope that you will either perform or present or do something fun with me as the reigning Mr. Hollywood. If I, if I can squeeze it into, <laughs> yeah, of course, absolutely. It, uh, it was, that's the, that was the thing is, again, uh, win, lose, or draw, uh, there have been... I've, I've done fewer than 50 festivals. Um, and that may seem like a lot for some folk, but for a lot of folk, it's not. Yeah. Um, I have my favorites and I have ones that I say, I'm glad I did it. I will never do that again. Um, and uh, the Hollywood Burlesque Festival was an extraordinary experience. Again, because of the, the, the curation and the team aspect of it. Um, I know it's not, it's not a one person um, adventure. So, yeah, absolutely. Short answer, yes. We'll, we'll talk deeds. We'll talk deeds. But um, in your in your uh, your time as uh, as a more as a more regularly performing entertainer, uh, what are some more of your your highlights that you hold close? My highlights are weird because as much That's as good. I, as much as I love being on stage. Things like being able to co-host in Vermont with Blanche Debris, being able to uh, work with, you know, um, uh, God, I love her and her name, <laughs> Foxy Tan and the Wham Bam Thank You Ma'am. I got to work with them in Vermont. Um, you know, I got to go to Hawaii. Ooh. I got to perform in Hawaii. That was so amazing because, you know, as a, as a full-time performer, I don't have a lot of extra money. So mm -hmm. to save up and perform in Hawaii and spend a week in Hawaii. And then my friends came out with his kids and we stayed an extra week. And that's what performance gave me. Um, mm -hmm. I, there are many things that have happened on stage that are incredible. Things like when your costume doesn't come off. I love those moments. Um, 
But for me, it's the people I got to work with. Um, I went and did the Las Vegas Burlesque Festival and <laughs> I got there. I, I was headed to go down there and Corey says to me, he goes, so what are you actually doing for the opening number? And I went, what opening number, Corey? <laughs> and he goes, didn't we talk about an opening number? And I'm like, no. <laughs> so I grabbed two Hollywood Burlesque Festival headdresses drove down there, made myself a matching costume, and I harangued, uh, uh, oh God, I'm going to forget her name. Oh, it me from Glorious Pasties. Oh, um, Ch Cheeky Cheetah. Cheeky Cheetah. I, I said, hey, will you be in this? And then Reagan choreographed the opening number for me. And it comes out and they're playing Hooray for Hollywood. And we come out and we're doing this little, you know, that he choreographed for me in the back of the Orleans. And, and then uh, Anita Brazier comes over and she goes, uh, Lily? And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, um, you're in Las Vegas. And I'm like, oh, never mind. Ladies, go wait in the car. And then I started the show. Literally, I'm like, I have no opening number. You didn't tell me I had to do an opening number. So again, an entire team came together and made me look like a comedic genius. <laughs> um, but these two are out there just dancing their hearts out. And then I'm like, go wait in the car, girls. You know, and then I had them come out and they, they took my hair, my headdress off and they clipped hair onto me. They touched up my makeup and I moved on and I'm like, all right, let's get on with the show. <laughs> and, and it was just, it was fabulous. I, there's video of it somewhere and I will probably find it at some point and just laugh again hysterically. I don't know if it is as funny as it was in my head, <laughs> but honestly, Ray gun out in the back, helping me choreograph this. And I'm just standing there going, how did I, how did, how is this my life? I spend a lot of my time on stage, standing on stage, looking at the audience going, how is this my life? I'm taking my clothes off. This is amazing. <laughs> They're applauding for this. <laughs> and, and it's just, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. Mm -hmm. I, every time I'm on stage that it is just this, this moment of how did I get, how did it all work out for this moment to happen? And that's a joy that I, I hope everybody who performs gets. I feel sad for women who are in their heads so hard because I am just like, I, sometimes I feel like I'm just this goofy thing that managed to walk on stage with a couple mechanical poodles. People laughed and clapped and took my clothes off and we all went home. And it's just, it's, a, it's, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it other than that. Even for yeah. dinner and a showgirl, I write it and I'm like four days before I'm supposed to film something. I'm like, I'm throwing all of that out. You know, what sounds really good. Uh, I'm going to make rice and I'm going to measure it with my bra cup size, you know? And it's like two cups. I've now fed 17. <laughs> I threw out a whole script for that one joke. A lot of a lot of the stuff I do on stage is that as well. Boudini is that way on stage. That's one of my greatest experiences. I performed as a magician at a at a at a magic convention, and I pulled a six foot magic wand out of my vagina, and I'm like, "Screw all of you and your misogyny here. Magic comes from right here, and you're gonna watch it." And it was <laughs> amazing. So I mean, to me, those are great. Another one is, I don't know if you ever watched The Mentalist. I'm familiar with the idea of it. Okay. The lead character, I can never remember his name, was he came to Monday Night Tees one night and he's like oh. standing by the sound booth and you have to like walk up the stairs into the sound booth. And I swear to God, every time I would lean over and I go, I'm really sorry, I got to go up to the sound booth again. And I would walk by and eventually he would just step to the side and smile. And so as he's leaving, or, or, yeah, right before the last one I go up, He's got an Australian accent. And I'm like, he yeah. looks so familiar. And he has it. Oh my God, that's the Australian guy. That's the guy in mentalist. <laughs> so I'm standing at the door as I always do at the end of the show. And I glad hand and I thank people for coming. And I tell him, you know, we're come back. We are glad we had you. And he walks up and he goes, I really loved your work tonight. And I looked at him and I go, I love yours too. I know who you are now. <laughs> <laughs> those are, those are the moments that the, just the silliness of, of what we do for a career is yeah. is what makes it great for me. I want to uh, touch also on another aspect of your of your work, and that is mentoring and instruction. Oh yes. Uh, why did you decide one that it was something that you were capable of, wanted to do, and then kept doing? 
Um, I asked my dad how a radio worked when I was like 12. And he goes, I don't know, take it apart and figure it out. <laughs> so I took it apart and I couldn't put it back together. And then I went, damn it, how does a radio work? <laughs> and so then I like looked it all up, figured out how to put it all back together. And I'm like, that's amazing. Then I started looking and I have found that I hated college. I hated school because I was dyslexic, but I loved learning. And one of the things that I found was I learned better one-on-one -on -one with a person as opposed to reading in a book. I just, that's how I absorb things and can visualize things. I can do math in my head. I cannot do it on paper because none of the letters look right. It's very weird because I visualize it in groups. I visualize okay. four apples plus four apples equals eight apples. I can't look at four and four. It doesn't work for me. Okay. So in, in this, I kept learning and learning. And when I started into the beauty industry, which I was in, I was an esthetician and uh, nail technician um, and then did hair eventually as well. Um, the thing that I gravitated to was the programs like from OPI where they're like, come learn a new process. And I would learn it one-on-one -on -one, and then I would be able to teach it. And that was something that worked well for me because I didn't learn well from teachers teaching a class. And so I always found that if I don't learn that way, other people can't learn that way. So I have all this knowledge. Why am I not sharing it? And that's kind of how I decided to start teaching because the woman in LA that I took classes from took everybody's money and then left. <laughs> and oh. so I ended up teaching classes along with uh, another girl here and did it for free for eight people. One of them was Red Snapper. Um, and that's where I started teaching because no one was teaching in LA and people weren't getting information. I started because at the time when I started radio, I was still married. I had a really nice job. I had money. I lived in a beautiful house. Things were everything that they should be for someone who wanted to grow up and have a perfect life. And I was miserable. <laughs> so I started doing burlesque. And then I had the opportunity to take one-on-ones with legends and learn from legends and take from them and they became my friends and I got all of this additional knowledge that we'd kind of just been learning from each other as we could and I realized that all of these women have given me this and they have given so much to burlesque that newer people don't have someone needs to be the storyteller that keeps going with that and that's when I decided to start doing mentoring I have uh, mentoring performers online on Facebook um it used to be more active, but as it got bigger, people were like, I don't like to ask specific problems because that person might be in here. <laughs> so I do sure. a lot of generalizations when I get questions, um, but there's a wealth of knowledge in there. And I started teaching get an act because there are so many aspects to burlesque that you may not even understand in, 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 you know, costume construction and glues and all of the things that are the tools to build off of. So I started teaching that way as well and mentoring that way. And I think it's really important. When I had the stage at three clubs, I had, I, I could be in there all night, but I didn't really have the energy to try to make two shows viable. So I decided to do an early show. And I would say to people, you have this going on. Would you like to try producing a small show? There won't be a lot of cost to it. And you'll have the venue and you'll have the support of me pushing that Shows like Babylon Cabaret came out of that because, you know, uh, I, I want to always use their real names now because I talk to them more out of burlesque, uh, Cat House Red and Misspent Youth. Yeah. Um, they do all original music and they were like, this sounds fun. And they started the Babylon Cabaret and it was right before Monday Night Tees. And, and finally they got to the point of where I, I was like, they're getting too good to be in an early spot, you know? And they finally came to me and said, we found a venue and we're going to do this. And I was like, fantastic. What else can I do to support you? Um, because... The more stages we have, the more performers there are. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so to me, mentoring them, getting them a start on a stage and pushing them off to do something is the best gift you can give to performers for them to grow and for new performers to come in. So to me, if, if you don't mentor back and you don't give back to a community, you're not part of a community. So that's what got me into it. You know, because right, you can be an entertainer or performer, but that doesn't really make you part of the community per se. I will tell everyone this when they will call me up with a question. And this is a question you should ask yourself as a producer or a performer. Do you want business answer? Or do you want mentor growth answer? Because as I said earlier, 
I wish I would have sometimes made a few different choices because I could have, I could have done more in burlesque at Monday Night Tees, mm -hmm. but I could have also crashed my business. So sometimes it's a business versus a mentor. It's like when you, did you like my act? Do you want me to tell you what I thought of your act as someone who could book it, as someone who watched it with my personal opinion, as someone who teaches or as someone, so looking at all of those things together allow you to decide where you want to go with your art and mentoring is really important to say you are an audience member what did you think of my act you are a producer would you book this act you are a teacher what could make this act stronger and i don't say better i say stronger for the purpose you're making it i i can do the act at monday night teas and it works perfectly but i can't necessarily do that on a huge stage so I have to make it better and different on a big stage. And those are the things a lot of people didn't understand. I mean, in my class, I talk about how you need to have two openings and two endings to your act. One, if you have a curtain, one, if you don't, you got to be able to go left or right enter, because if mm -hmm. you're constantly focused and the only way you can get onto stage is this way, you're fucked. Yeah. I showed up in Vermont and I was like, I can't walk up the front stage because <laughs> the steps are like this and I have a, I have an iPad. You, you can't visualize this. The steps were like, um, I think they were like nine inches and they were seven inches deep and there was no way I could walk up them in a blindfold without someone escorting me. So I had to enter from back and my music was only so long. So I had to change my whole music when I got there. Um, it kind of flustered me um, because I didn't follow my own rule because I was like, oh, I can just walk up the front steps. Everything will be great when I get there. Sure. I mean, it I can had to even... change everything for the night. I mean, I've had, when I was hosting uh, regularly at uh, Rock Bar in our, our Manhattan show, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't introduced. I was the host. I introduced everybody else. But at the end of the first set or the end of the second set, I would just go up unannounced. Holy so God. I had to create an intro track to allow me to walk up, have the kitten clear, yep. and it not be breaking into people. Some of those acts permanently have that intro now because I realized I like that time. Oh, uh, I there are people who have to then also consider festival length. Yep. So have a, I, I have a four minute version of digital get down. I don't love it, but I can do it. If that's what your limit is, if you and can give me the full five, thank you, but I'll do four. That right uh, there is what a, a mentor can give you because mm -hmm. if you've only ever performed on three stages in your town, you're going to show up at Behoff and go, this stage is five times bigger than I am. I told someone that that was going to Behoff, the best thing you can do is ask them if they can give you a focus light so that the rest of the stage is dark and the entire room has to come in and focus on you. Mm -hmm. Because if the whole stage has a wash on it, you are going to get lost because mm -hmm. you are stationary through 90% of your act because of what you're doing. Pull the focus down straight into you so that people have to focus in on you. If they hadn't had me, there could have been a wash on the stage and it could have been a completely different experience. And I'll tell you at the end of it, it was absolutely gorgeous. And the only reason I knew that is because I buddied around with Satan, Satan's angel forever. And she would be like, girl, this is what you need to do with this. And don't ever mm -hmm. do that with this. And here's how it's done in Chicago. And here's how it's done here. And I do a terrible Satan's angel. Um, but, but it was that growth of understanding different places that I could impart that information and allow them to do something different. And honestly, I don't know if the people at Behoff would have said, you know, we can spot you and just, just you alone. They have an incredible tech team, by the way. I, you know, but their job isn't to necessarily tech your act. It's your job when you go to that stage. It's like listening to the, the, the legends also saying, you know, don't ever wear uh, a, a light yellow on stage because the moment they put that video on you, you're going to look either green or brown, mm -hmm. you know? So unless you can get a, a peach light or a whatever, I would change the lights out at, at three clubs. I would go in and I had my own mm -hmm. gels. I would take the gels down and I would put cosmetic gels up so that the sparkles on the costumes are beautiful in the pictures, you know, on our Prince mm -hmm. show, we had a whole purple backwash. A lot of people don't have that lux luxury or knowledge. That's what mentoring does. It allows you to ask questions that you don't even know you need to ask. And that's why I think it's so important. Yeah. We don't have colleges of burlesque that teach you lighting and sound, <laughs> you know, no, we, we have, have, we basically, I have $50. Can you edit this? <laughs> <laughs> we have basically just like, uh, anecdotes 
that yeah. we that either can be translated into an instructional sense yeah. or what we talk about after the show while we're smoking and drinking. Like it's 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 either it's the it depends on the tone of like, yeah. oh, this time, this learning moment that we had. I, uh, I try to say everything is a learning moment. It's not necessarily a failure. It's an education. Um, you know, and again, it's embarrassing as hell when you get your period on stage because I was irregular all of my life. And there's this great photo of me and I'm bent over and I'm like, yeah, look, that's all period blood. Um, can you take that photo down? <laughs> well, I mean, it might be very popular with a certain subset of people, but I don't think it sells me best as a performer. <laughs> you know, I have, I have uh, a friend who I don't know if I don't have permission to use their name with the story, but um, when they were doing uh, an act, uh, this is at the slipper room in New York city. And they realized that they normally had uh, like that. They're uh, what was it? Oh, uh, slipper room allows you to be fully naked. If oh, yeah. So choose. And yeah. they had a G string on, but it was it was one of those um, pretend lace ones where basically everything's still yeah. being seen. Yeah. And they realized that they didn't have uh, a tampon and they needed it. And they, but their only turn was a pad. And they're like, I can't wear a pad with this. It'll look funny. And like, all right, I'll risk it. And she did the act. And during the act, Yep. The flow began and she was like, and then I noticed it and I had two, I, I had two alternative, I had two options. I could either freak out or I'd be like, yeah, that's the act now. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly yeah. it became this act that, that, that was a reveal. There you go. There you go. And the audience just went with it because as I've also tried to keep as one of, one of my mantras uh, is that the audience knows what we tell them. Yep, and the audience absolutely. believes what we tell them. And yeah. if you don't tell the audience that you fucked up or that this happened or this was yeah. out of your control, they'll be like, that was great. <laughs> it, it is your job to control the audience and to take them where you want to take them. And sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you walk into a room and it's not a bad audience. It's just not your audience. Okay, all I, right. A band? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. As a pastor's kid growing up in the 90s, there was a lot of mainstream entertainment that I was sheltered from. Stephen Root, he does one of the voices. Okay. You know him from news radio. Do I? You know him from office space. Do I? You know... <laughs> uh, most things, really. So, now that I am an independent and out queer 30-something, I'm finally asking my friends to teach me about all the stuff I missed out on. Wait, Raffi did Beatles covers? Yes, he did. My mind is blown. <laughs> he did Octopus's Garden. And, um... Yeah, I remember Octopus's yeah, Garden. No. I didn't know that that wasn't a Raffi original <laughs> until just now. The re-education of Hazel Tarts. Subscribe now. Kevin Costner. He was so foxy. You... I know the name, I don't know the face. I cannot. What is Kevin Costner? Can you just show me a picture of Kevin Costner's no, face, please? Think of the guy, this is hurting not me. Cheech Marin, but think of the other guy in Tin Cup. I've never seen that. your job to control the audience and to take them where you want to take them and sometimes it doesn't work sometimes mm -hmm. you walk into yeah. a room and it's not a bad audience it's just not your audience yeah. i went and did the oc one time and i walked in about to do big mouth feminist vagic you know and i'm hosting this and i'm just you know i'm this big titted loud mouth woman and i drove up and there was a trump sign literally the size of the crazy building across from the venue and i just went oh why did they book me? <laughs> Why? And I walked in and I kind of like felt the audience out and I'm like, they are going to hate me. Crap. And so I had to make that decision of, do I change my, my persona and like dumb it down to get through this night? Or do I just charge through this? And I talked to the producer and I'm like, what do you want me to do? And she goes, be yourself. If they hate you, they hate you. And I'm like, all right. 
<laughs> Easy for you to say. It's not fun. It's not, it's not fun to show up in a country and Western bar and you're dancing to disco. And it's like, why did they book this act? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So it, it is weird how you get in those experiences. Luckily, the slipper room was like, yeah, if you'd have done that at Monday Night Tease, I'd have been like, come on. God damn it. <laughs> You know, and not that I would be mad, but I would be like, really? All right. Mm, fuck. <laughs> and yeah, Bloody it's hell. about it's about being um, I mean, not every not every performer even wants to be um, I don't want to say versatile because that sort of makes it seem like then therefore controversial, I think is the word. Well, I mean, well, even uh, one one thing that I when I was speaking with Pearl Noir at one point about her outfits. And I said, yeah. I've seen that look before, but you do it with a different, to a different song. And I, I love how you, she's like, oh, no, no. Every outfit has three or four different songs, depending yeah. on the venue. Because this, if they're going to book this, because they know that they want this, yeah. but it's a, but it's a, a jazz club, then yeah. we're going to do it to say, I'll say Dinah Washington. Oh, but I can wear this outfit and I'll do Donna Summer over at this place. It's, it's amazing to me. Um, misspent youth was in my last show and she had shot a champagne glass act for her new year's show and i said i need a four minute version of that could you re-edit it to different music possibly boy was that amazing that you have that option now <laughs> you know what i mean mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> I, know, just, I just submitted to a digital i just submitted to a digital festival and I, my track is a little too long. So I went in and I changed the speed of the video. There you go. And it's just enough. It's yes. just enough. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing what you can do when you are ready to think outside of the box, which I think is the greatest skill set you can have here. I, my choreography is, my choreography is never uh, an eight count of anything. My choreography is in this 16 counts, I want to do at least these two moves and I need to move from this side of the stage to the next because I'm not a strong dancer um, for many reasons. Um, having said that, I watch some girls that just put so much pressure on themselves like they're in the middle of the ice capades and if they don't get that triple lux done, you know, it's like, let your body breathe. Go with what you need to do sometimes. Choreograph two thirds of your act and play with the audience. Have fun up there. Um, you know, if you're a solid dancer and that's that brings you joy, do that. I'm not telling you it's wrong, but man, you gotta be able to not beat yourself up for not doing it exactly the way you thought it should mm -hmm. happen every time. And give yourself permission to say no yeah. if that show wasn't gonna work. Because oh, I know yes. that we equate death with stopping. And we yes. equate death with missing. I have a performer who took a year off. She's like, no one's going to remember me. And I'm like, just come back as good as you were with knowing what you learned in that hiatus of a year because you needed that break. And she when came I, back stronger and nailed it. When I decided to stop performing, I had just come off Viva with Elvira and Viva with John Waters. And I love Audrey Deluxe. Um, and I wrote her a note and I basically said, um, I have no idea if you would ask me back, but I can't have you ask me back. Because I can't say no, and I need to. <laughs> and so I said, here's three people that I think would be amazing. And if you respect my opinion, this is the one that I think is the best fit and would be amazing. And, um, you know, it was, it was my way of taking control of that situation. Mm -hmm. And Coravette got the gig. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. Viva didn't happen last year. Um, but I was so proud for her. Um, that, that's the other thing. When I lose a gig to Blanche Debris or Cora or Foxy Tan or any of the other amazing MCs out there, I never go, fuck them. I go, fuck, they have a great gig. That's amazing. You know, um, th that's the other thing. When you're not right for something, man, don't force it. Don't force it. If you think you can grow your boundaries to make it work, yes. But send someone who's better. I often go, you know, who you really need is so-and-so. And she's going to be cheaper because she's only flying in from New York. Mm. You know, I love losing gigs to Miss Astrid. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. He's like, you need eye patch gal? I got yeah. the one for you. And she'll do well, the it's, German it's, accent. It's really funny because after my eye blew out, I started wearing an eye patch. And at the time, I had a bob. 
<laughs> and I went, oh, this is not good. So I just started wearing wigs. And then I put streaks in my hair because I was like, I don't want anyone to think I'm her. And then I was at Vermont because she and I have hosted together at Vermont. And then she hosted one year when I wasn't there. Um, I was the most brought back MC at, at Vermont. I was just told they just did a documentary about the festival. And she, they were like, you're the person that's been booked the most. And I was like, my God, thank you for, for trusting me. But she was there the year. And then I came back and I had my eye patch and I'm on stage and someone walked up to me and they went, I just want to let you know, um, you were funny last year and you were just as funny this year. And I was like, I wasn't here last year. That was Miss Astrid. But thank you. That is a huge, <laughs> that is a huge honor that you thought I was still as good as her. <laughs> like, it was so funny. Um, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> be happy for the people you love in this, be happy for the people you hate in this, because, you know, if they're doing well, it just makes you want to go, how do I be better at what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, again, if somebody gets a gig, I want it. I'm like, what can I do to be different or better or more exciting? Hmm. Huh. It's not so much a competition as you, you don't know this, but I was just like grabbing my beard hair. Yes, um, it, was, it was that. Hmm. Yeah. 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 I, you know, what can I do to stand out a little bit different or a little bit better? You know, were you how long have you been going to the burlesque hall of fame? I have yet to. Okay, last so one, year, last year was supposed to be yeah. the first one that I was, fault, because I was finally on the West Coast. I was finally on the West Coast. I was going to have my car. It was planned. I was looking at hotels. And there we are. One of my favorite things that happened at Behoff was one year there were no large props on stage. Nothing. It was all just dance. And then the following year, there was a cigar and there was an absinthe class and there was a bowl. And there was, and it was like every one of them had a prop. I, I'm like, I don't know how they stored all those props at the Orleans backstage. But it's so funny to me about how you would go to Behoff and then like, you know, somebody would teach, you know, one of the legends would teach their, um, you know, uh, dusters, you know, and then the next year everyone would have dusters. <laughs> And then you would come back and they would all do panel skirts. And then the next year it would all be panel skirts. And it's like, I would always go when people were asking me, so how do I, how do I win it? Be? How about I always go, all right, look at who taught last year and don't do any of that. Cause everybody's going to be doing that. Come in and be the bagel. In the room. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, you know how many times, how many boy lusk shows I've done where like half the cast is in a suit. Like, well, yeah. that's what, that's the starting point. That is the boy panel skirt for a lot of us. So well, yeah, it's, it's like absolutely. gloves and gowns are fans. You absolutely. know, you can only do so many in a row, do a variation. Absolutely. The first act I ever saw that made me think that I did not know what the fuck I was doing in burlesque was, um, God damn it. Trini Stevens, Little Brooklyn. Shit. It's one of the two of them. They, they're, they were producers together. They did a, um, uh, uh the you go girl, Rosie, the riveter. Uh-huh. And they did a fan dance with hubcaps. Mm-hmm. And that's when I went, everything I know about burlesque, I have to flip on its head and look at everything completely different and go back to a base of not trying to be a burlesque dancer. Because my first act, it was like, I have a gown. I have a boa. I have tassels. I have this. I have that. Check. I'm a burlesque dancer. Um, that really was how I came to stage because I wanted to be Gypsy Rose Lee and I realized I'm not Gypsy Rose Lee in any way, shape or form. <laughs> I mean, and that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes because we look at our friends and colleagues and our idols and a lot of times they share the yeah. same bodies. But, but I'm grateful that Gypsy brought me to who I am, you mm-hmm. know, because if I hadn't have seen Gypsy Rose Lee with my mom sitting on the couch watching it, not understanding she was a stripper as a kid and then growing into going, oh, that's really kind of what I want to do. Uh, but you can't do that. You're a good Catholic girl, even though you're not Catholic, uh, you know, and then I, I did all the nails for the strippers and just envied them because I was like, I just want to get on the pole, ah! you know, but I didn't have the strength. I just didn't. Um, but I got there eventually. Um, but yeah, I mean, you look at that and it's like you grow and change and then you evolve into who you are. When you watch magicians, they start out emulating the magician that they love. And then eventually, after about a year or two, they develop who they are as a magician. Mm-hmm. And burlesque dancers hopefully are the same way. You well, know? I know it's definitely true in, in the drag world because yes. I, you, see, you see complaints about like, oh, another person in a leotard. Like, look at the pop stars. Ariana Grande wears a leotard. Beyonce wears a leotard. Guess what? That's the fashion. And it may be different in two years, but that's what, what's going on. Yeah. 
there's there's only so many ways to take your clothes off. I know 47 ways to take a glove off. I can take a glove off 47 different ways. Do you know that there's still four ways gloves are taken off predominantly on stage? Because it works and it works well. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you don't always have to do a trick. You know, <laughs> sometimes so, it's just functional. Sometimes, yeah, it's, sometimes just... <laughs> it's just functional or it moves you to the next thing that you have to do in burlesque. Sometimes, which the then will be perhaps a little bit off. more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to take my glove off so I can take the zipper off. Otherwise, I'd have my gloves off till the end because I think it's kind of cool to never touch myself, but touch myself. Because mm-hmm. I have this whole thing about, you know, is the glove your hand? Is the glove your audience? And that was something that came to me through uh, Indigo Blue. Right. You know, she has a great class on are you showing your hand? Or are you showing the decorations of the glove? Right. Are you yeah. taking your glove off to hide your boobs in front of you? Or are you taking your glove off to show them the sexiest hand they've ever seen in the world? You know, and again, I don't do, do, do a good indigo blue, um, but, it, but it's, a, <laughs> it's a very dramatic reading of what is it that you're presenting to the audience? And so mm-hmm. there's a reason to take it off 47 different ways. Well, I still every like act red- is going to be a different yeah. reason. Yeah, my my dear friend Regina Stargazer out of New Jersey, New York. Yes. we would do some uh, instruction. We go. We, we were asked to do some classes, and she one of her core was she would we had her do the gloves, and and then the the sort of the the sultry, and she'd be like, touch yourself, and how I do it is I touch myself like I want to be touched. Yes. I'm like okay, that's 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 where that that that's where that principle comes from. Yeah, and everything is wiggly and wobbly, and you can change things up. There, there's so many ways to look at burlesque and there are so many different facets of it from, oh, we have nerd, we have uh, best nerd adaptation for the Hollywood burlesque. Festival. Oh, I can't, uh, looking <laughs> yeah. forward, looking forward. Um, so, but, but the idea is, you know, what is it that, what is it that you want to tell? What is it that you love? And, you know, for me, burlesque, the only key thing is that clothes are probably coming off. If that's happening, it's burlesque to me probably happening yeah probably. everything else is everything else is you know tap dancing can be burlesque even if you're not taking your clothes off if it's a if it's the variety act in the middle of a burlesque show but it can also strictly be burlesque if you're tap dancing and taking your clothes off mm-hmm. so you know do what you love rocky horror is burlesque in so many ways absolutely um, they from, do it. from the comedy and sexuality even if you they do a whole floor show they do a whole yes. floor show where they get naked her <laughs> There's there's a million ways to come at burlesque. I always get asked, so what do you think the future of burlesque is? And I'm like, if I knew that, I would be a goddamn millionaire. Yeah. But I don't because I didn't. Who would have said two years ago, you know what the next big thing in burlesque is going to be? Online movies. Get that Zoom stock. Yeah. Plastic. Only. <laughs> yeah. Plastic, yeah. exactly. Plastic. Yeah. It's yeah. to me, it's the greatest thing on earth you can do. I, I just, there's so much joy in burlesque for me. I can't even tell you, you know, I'm so glad. I'm, I'm a fan first. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, I think that's a necessary component. I think it's a necessary component. If you, if you don't, if you need, I mean, everyone has their own process uh, and I'm not tattooing anybody's process, but if you are normally the outgoing, watching, hanging, chilling, and then you find yourself withdrawing, take, take some time off, take some time off, recalibrate and figure out. And there are some, there are some of our great, great names in our scene who have not touched the digital virtual realm and they may never. And I don't know what's coming out at the end of this. I know a couple of, uh, some folk have said that this is probably it for them. Um, we'll see, none of us know. There's a million burlesque dancers that hung their G-strings up that now are legends at the Burlesque Hall of Fame. Don't ever count it out. Tempest mm-hmm. Storm was dancing up until, what, five years ago, mm-hmm. I think it was. Um, you know, you, you don't know what the future is going to hold for you. Angel never thought she would come back and perform again. And Dixie brought her out and, and uh, uh, Baby Doe at Tizarama got her to perform for the first time. And she came back and, and had a second career with this. You don't know what the future will hold. Um, but I can tell you, if I never got on a stage again or performed again after the next show I have, April 24th, I can tell you that I look back on this with some of the fondest, happiest memories I have of amazing people that I got to do really cool shit with. 
I, I just, it's been a ride. Um, and I hope I never lose that perspective or joy, but mm-hmm. I will forever be clapping for others, celebrating their successes, even if I'm not up there, because it's friggin' fun. Yeah, well, I will just about leave it with that. And thank you again with, for, for spending the time with me and sharing your enthusiasm and your wonder and your love for it. I do have one final question and that is when does the book come out? <laughs> I'm dyslexic. You can you can speak it to somebody else. You can, uh, what do you call that? Dictate. You can I, do that. You could do I that. have been working on this for a long time. I, the process of creating something for me is the process of when it feels right. Mm-hmm. And every time I have sat down to write over the last probably six months, I have not been able to do a lot of that. It took me a long time to decide what the book would be Mm -hmm. um, as well, because, you know, a a life lived is a life that has a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, A lot of editing too, a lot of editing out. Well, I I have someone who's going to do editing for me, which I am very grateful for. Um, But, you know, when you, when you write about yourself, there is a very weird ego thing that happens. And as much as I love being on stage, I have social anxiety and I want nothing to do with people off of it. <laughs> I, I'm sure you've seen me go, it's lovely to see you. I have to go do something right now. I never have to go do anything. There's just too many people. I'm not good when there's a lot of people. I throw parties and then I sit in the corner and I walk around going, do you have enough ice? Okay, good. I'm going to get, it's lovely to see you. Um, and then I like, you know, five minutes here and there. The book is the same way for me right now. So it's been hard. I will tell you, there is someone working on a documentary about Monday Night Tees. I have basically handed over footage and said, do what you see fit because I don't want to tell that story. I want that story to be told by someone who experienced it and loved it and can tell the story of coming to Monday Night Tees and experiencing it. They're not even a dancer. And I think that's a better story for Monday Night Tees than me going, here's shit I liked. You know, (laughs) that's not a good documentary. The the book is a process and it is being worked on, I promise. But it's it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to share a lot of stuff also because you're sharing other people's stories, too. And um, they're all alive still. <laughs> I wanted to call it behind the glitter. I know where the bodies are buried, um, <laughs> but I thought it's a little too soon to write that book. <laughs> Do you know what's funny is you could just as easily call it behind the bodies. I know where the glitter is buried. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and again, I, I want it to be uplifting about the joy of burlesque. And so it's it's very hard to censor out certain stories and censor out people sometimes, too. So mm-hmm. it's been a very soul searching process that's been very uncomfortable <laughs> because when you have 15 years of shows yeah. and two careers before that that got you into it. Um, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. It's it's a weird process, but it I am working on it. I promise. Cool, cool. Well, I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. Well, I mean, I did, but I didn't. I did. Well, if you I want did. a good one that you haven't read, <laughs> get Marinka's. Oh, you know what? I should absolutely. You're yeah, right. uh, another one that is absolutely wonderful is Brandy Wilds. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's there's two I can recommend. Dusty Summers has an incredible one as well. Um, a, a lot of them do. Mm-hmm. Um, those are just the the few that I have read in the last probably three to five years. Um, yeah, because I just finally plowed through Marinka's. It was I'm better with an audible for some yeah. reason. The way that my I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a writer, so I should be able yeah. to read more easily. But a lot of times, I get my brain gets bored. My, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so I will I will check those out. But Thank those you. are some great ones. And if you're just getting into burlesque and you came to this, buy Joe Boob's book. Joe Weldon is um, the book on it. Yeah, it is the book. It is, it is the book that if I could have written a book about, here's the basics of putting it together. I'd have written that book. I admire her so much for pulling that together. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So the gold standard, my darling, thank you so much. I am, I am a fan as well. And I appreciate all that you've done and all that uh, we will continue to manage to do together, whatever, whatever that ends up meaning, but know that I'm, I'm in for it. Awesome. All right. Yes. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. You too. I'll talk to you soon.
We Were Less the Podcast, property of We Were Less Corporation, all rights reserved, Victor Devon. Opening and closing music, Anna 45 by This Way to the Egress, available on iTunes, Amazon Music, Spotify, or wherever you get your songs, used with permission. Please visit weberlesspodcast.com for show notes on this and any other episode of We Were Less the Podcast.